Welcome to Neuro Noodles Neurofeedback and Neuropsychology Podcast featuring tech legend Jay Gunkelman. He is the man who has read well over a half a million brain scans. Our goal is to provide information and promote options for better mental health. The Neuro Noodle Podcast is supported by listeners and businesses just like you, like our gold supporter, Applied Neuroscience, and our silver supporter, Mind Media. Earn up to 16 CEU hours by attending Applied Neuroscience NeuroGuide workshops in Madeira Beach, Florida, led by none other than Dr. Robert Thatcher himself. There are two ways you can attend, online or in person, with the link AppliedNeuroscience.com slash attend hyphen NG hyphen workshops. Earn up to 16 CEU hours now at AppliedNeuroscience.com slash attend hyphen NG hyphen workshops. Mind Media, get the latest EEG and neurofeedback technology from MindMedia.com. Their semi-dry sensor cap is a wonder to see and their EEG amplifiers have been trusted in the field for decades. Their neurofeedback and QEEG courses will get you up to speed in no time. Visit MindMedia.com now. Join us at the 7th Annual Super Brain Summit at Bradley University Center for Collaborative Brain Research. It's featuring speaker Dr. Mary Frances O'Connor. She's the author of The Grieving Brain, The Surprising Science of How We Learn from Our Love and Loss. If you want to get more information regarding registration, contact Gwen Hoarter. She's at G-H-O-W-A-R-T-E-R at bradley.edu or call her at 309-677-3900. If you want more information regarding programming, you can contact Dr. Lori Russell Chapin herself at 309-677-3186 or email LA are at bradley.edu i think one of the things that's popped up uh, recently was um uh, a magazine um a science magazine basically uh, suggesting that uh that burger uh, changed uh psychology and um that that uh, neuropsychology and psychology are all due to burger and um, I, I would like to kind of set history straight as to who that asshole was. It's been covered over and papered over uh, by uh, luminaries like Niedermeyer uh, saying that, you know, he wasn't really a Nazi and he was forced out of his position and, you know, he committed suicide because of the pressure and whatnot. But it's just bullshit. It's just covering over the history of our field uh, with, you know, and, you know, there's a lot of things that grow up out of bullshit, but um, it, uh, mushrooms. It, it, yeah. Uh, <laughs> not the kind that uh, were the last of the world ones, but uh, um, so, it, it, you know, discussing that a little bit, you know. Um, we're already discussing it. Okay. But, you know, um the the magazine basically uh you know burger he had a a, a near death experience and thought of his sister at a great distance and the telepathy they had to have communicated and that there must be something going through the ether you know between brains and he was looking for that now uh he was a nazi and he did experiments in Jena at the university on Jews that were prisoners, things like sticking thermometers in their brain. Well, that's not very friendly, you know. Um, I'm not going to line up for somebody to, to, you know, oh, over here, I volunteer for a thermometer to be stuck in my no, they usually stick it at the other end, you know. I, I don't know about the sticking it in your brain thing. And so, but you know, he was he was doing experiments on Jews and and, and not good ones. Um uh, his experiment to record the EEG was non-invasive, and he did that on his son, uh, but uh, he was on sterilization boards where they decided, oh, well, you're, you're not the kind of person we want to see reproducing, so you get sterilized. If you're in the 
if a Jew was sent to the neuropsychiatric institute, they basically sterilized the women. And uh, um, he, he had a diary that he kept. And in the diary, he's got entrances like, I went on vacation and those damn Jews were on the beach and it ruined my vacation. Well, that, that, that's not very friendly or neighborly or, you know. And, um, but, you know, uh, apparently, you know, having the founder of the phenomenon of EEG was enough that people wanted to kind of cover it over. I mean, it's an ugly history. There's no no way around it, but you don't you don't make history you know better by making it false. Uh, and, and there were a lot of people discovering electrical properties in animals' brains. That if he hadn't published in the late twenties, um, it would have been you know done by somebody else. Um, as soon as his paper was out. Uh, Adrian and Matthews in 1930 in, in England. Um, uh, Adrian had alpha. Matthews had a low voltage fast EG that they called an EG with no apparent rhythmicity. Uh, they didn't call it low voltage fast. Um, uh, at the same time, Lennox's lab in at Harvard and uh, uh, Fred and Erna Gibbs, well, Erna wasn't a Gibbs at the moment, uh, but they that they discovered that you could see epilepsy in the EEG uh, at the same point in time at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, you, you've got uh, Charlie Yeager, not the pilot. That's how we always introduce an MD, PhD, uh, Charlie Yeager, not the pilot. Um, but it, uh, he, you know, they, uh, they started their own lab. They made their own amps. Um, <laughs> their, their amps were funky. Um, and uh, high moisture would ruin them, uh, or a really big muscle contraction would ruin the amp. They had a crystal, a salt crystal, uh, 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 with a pen stuck on, glued on the top of the crystal. And the crystals are piezoelectric, and if you pass current through them, the crystal twists. So you you got deflections of from the EEG, That's and. <laughs> It's okay. Did you say that? <laughs> it looks like you're in a better place than I am. I'm just sitting here at home on, you know, on, I, the, on, on my chair. So I'm in a backyard somewhere in uh, Naples, uh, Florida, uh, Jay. And, uh, well, it, it looked like the attire and uh, the background, <laughs> you know, so. so. But, but, but anyways, you know. But Jaeger uh, and and his lab uh, in in uh, the early thirties, um, they, they actually had no budget. I mean, EG wasn't a thing. Uh, they were trying to build their lab at the Mayo Clinic, and they they started to paint their lab with whitewash. And the union painters in the hospital complained, "You're using a paintbrush, which means you're." You know, you're violating our union contract. You can't use a paintbrush and and paint your lab. Uh, but they were um, they were friendly union people. They they were just trying to assert their union rights, and they said use use a broom. <laughs> so they dipped the broom in. They painted their room with a broom um, uh, and, and got it all whitewashed and you know ready for lab work. But their again, their amplifier was built on Epsom salt crystals, um, and uh, the the crystal would twist with the electrical currents being passed. Um, yeah, the polarity of the current, which which you you basically end up with an oscillating uh, current, and that twisted the crystal and printed out the EG. Well, you know, other people used a mirror and uh, a film going by, and the the mirror deflected the uh, light beam up and down, and that's how they got it. Um, but uh, the, the early days would have been the early days with or without burgers being the one. It was happening. It was a zeitgeist. A, a, a zeitgeist is an idea whose time has come. Uh, and a, a zeitgeist happens, you know, that 
the same thing discovered in four, four spots across the globe at about the same time. And everybody wants to claim being the founder of it. Well, you know, it's a zeitgeist. It doesn't matter who sticks their damn label of their name as the founder. Uh, it, it was something that was happening and would have happened with or without one or the other or the other of the people who were finding them. So uh, uh, the, the, the fact that Berger was a Nazi shouldn't be papered over. It should be, should be looked at. Now, it, let, let's say we packed our bags and uh, uh, jumped from California to Florida and we went over to Jena at the university. Well, at the university, uh, so there was a founder of the field of EEG who was there. Wouldn't there be a shrine? Wouldn't there be a laboratory that was kind of set aside as a memorial to the great man, you know, who founded this great field? You can't find shit for what some for what went on in Jena. Uh, uh, Germany treats Nazis appropriately. They erase them to the best of their ability. The fact that he still had. Uh, uh, diaries and stuff that could be found and read and translated. Uh, and there were some manuscripts. Um, but uh, R. Douglas Fields, who wrote The Electric Brain, um, that has an honest and in-depth review of the early days of everything from people stimulating frog legs to make them twitch, you know, with electricity and um uh, the uh, uh, making cadavers move uh, with with you know electricity reanimating with electricity the 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 uh, all of the early experiments with electrical stuff with humans and animals is detailed. The founding of all of this is and uh, building up to the founding of EG and applying that. Now. Um, it, 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 and and I think uh, reading through his account ends up cutting through the attempt to cover over really quite accurately. He did a historian's level, go to Jena, spend weeks and weeks and weeks there with a translator going through papers and documents and journals and, and uh, diaries, uh, and, you know, uh, contemporaneous uh, notes that were taken at sterilization boards, um, the fact that Berger uh, appointed his replacement, who was a well-known Nazi, and he still sat on sterilization boards after he re retired from the university. This wasn't somebody who was forced out for not being a Nazi. This was somebody who was, had severe depression, um, and uh, he, when he stepped down from heading his uh, department at the university. Uh, it isn't that he just went and killed himself. He was still, uh, uh, still ran around being the Nazi that he was. So Jay, when you, when you bring up Hans Berger, uh, Carl Ludwig always, always pops up with him. Why is that? Uh, there, there were a lot of con contemporaneous folks. Um, yeah. Uh, Berger wasn't the only uh, early character. Um, and and again, the, the 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 you know who was connected to who and where information was transferred back and forth and so forth it was really quite dynamic. The Berger was not the only early pioneer in EG that committed suicide either. Kaufman, who was really quite famous, um, uh, did himself in uh, due to pressure. You know, he, he was uh, 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 basically not a Nazi, and he was pressured out of his uh, position at the university. Uh, so, it, you know, there, 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 there's an interesting early history. Um, uh, I have to say that the, the book, The Electric Brain, doesn't stop by just, you know, dredging up material from the past and stopping. Uh, they actually go through the development of EEG into a clinical tool. Uh, the Gibbs and Gibbs uh, work with epilepsy. Um, uh, uh, you know the, the the use of EEG for epilepsy and encephalopathies. 
Um, and he went into neurofeedback. Uh, he, he actually had his EEG recorded uh, out on the East Coast. Um, and uh, they sent the EEG to me. I analyzed the EEG and reviewed it with him. Uh, he had a low voltage fast EEG. Uh, we discussed, you know, yeah, this common in alcoholism. Uh, he says, oh, my wife has always told me I should drink more. Um, you know, because it, 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 it gives somebody with a low voltage fast EEG that calms them down to the point where they have alpha. Um, and that, that kind of thing ends up being, uh, uh, you know, the useful findings. Now, he actually sat for neurofeedback sessions. Um, uh, uh, Jessica Ure in their office ran the sessions. Uh, his book actually has a, an, an interesting segment of it where he's doing just free association, you know, whatever is on your mind, chatting uh, on, a, a, as the stream of consciousness uh, for quite a few pages of what was going on in his head during the session. And, you know, <laughs> uh, a low voltage fast DEG is full of blah, 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 you know, <laughs> you know, so it's going all over the damn place, you know, and, and he's not getting, you know, better scores and the little periods that, um, uh, uh, that that you know the epoch of training time and then it, there's a little what, what sound years and, are we talking about here jerry what years uh, this is only a few years ago uh, uh and uh, the the book is a very recent book uh so um uh, uh, that at, at, towards the end they were ready to finish but he said well give me one more try and in that epoch he starts to think and you know uh, scuba diving and floating down and relax and and the session went in the flash you know he actually got relaxed and um uh, got a got a good score for that session uh he goes through from neurofeedback he talks about brain computer interface you know which has got some very interesting things going on obviously Elon Musk's uh, uh, group amongst others. And I have to say Elon Musk's group really has been underwhelming in their demonstrations for brain computer interface. There's, uh, they haven't done anything more than Burbomber had done 25 years, 30 years before that. So, you know, kind of underwhelming, a chimp, a, 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 a monkey that could play Pong. Um, I mean, uh, Pong was a game that Bur Burbomer used to train people to control their slow cortical potentials and train them how to not have epilepsy. Um, that, that your slow cortical potential can go electronegative, your brain is on, or electropositive, your brain is more off. And they taught you to move the slow cortical potential up and down on screen as a paddle or a window. And they had a, a you know, it's a Pong, you know, the, the the funky graphics, you know, they had a little rocket ship, the square with a point on one end, kind of that would fly from somewhere on the right axis across the page at some angle, and you could move the paddle up or down to fly it through the window. So you could adjust the speed across the screen and the size of the window to make it a more difficult task. But basically uh, somebody with epilepsy would take about 40 hours to learn how to operate that game well so that a small window with a fairly rapid transept and they could they could catch it like the monkey playing pong um, it, it, in an epileptic it took about 40 hours for a normal person about four hours and that's not an uncommon difference you know Jim Hart found an um, a normal university student could learn alpha control in about three and a half hours of training, total training time, the the fifth order learning curve, uh, which was his PhD dissertation in 74. So, you know, it, it, you know, that uh, you can learn control. Uh, we took Jim Hart's learning curve 
and applied it to our clinical patients who were being taught alpha. Uh, in 1972, when I started the lab, we were part of the alcoholism drug division at the state hospital. My patients that I had access to were all anybody in the alcoholism drug division or somewhere else in the hospital that somebody asked me to take a look at somebody. And the alcoholics were interesting because they had low voltage, fast EEGs. Very, very, very common pattern. Not everybody who drinks uh, to excess, but uh, people in the state hospital were there for a reason. The alcoholism drug division was populated by people who had a significant drinking problem. So uh, you had a high probability of finding low voltage, fast EEGs. When we found them, you now think about it. In 1972, what could you be doing for neurofeedback? Well, SMR or alpha, I mean, Sturman or Camilla, that was your choices, you know? So, and we looked at this low voltage fast stuff from the alcoholic and said, well, um, alpha, they don't have any alpha, let's train alpha. Stupid kid, you know, we weren't thinking in fancy systems theories or anything like that. We were just thinking, mm -hmm. no alpha, let's train it. Turn up to 16 CEU hours by attending Applied Neurosciences NeuroGuide workshops in Madeira Beach, Florida. They're led by none other than Dr. Robert Thatcher himself. There are two ways you can attend, online or in person, with the link AppliedNeuroscience.com slash attend hyphen ng hyphen workshops. Turn up to 16 CEU hours. Sign up now at AppliedNeuroscience.com slash attend hyphen ng hyphen workshops. Join us at the seventh annual Super Brain Summit at Bradley University Center for Collaborative Brain Research. It's featuring speaker Dr. Mary Frances O'Connor. She's the author of The Grieving Brain, The Surprising Science of How We Learn from Our Love and Loss. If you want to get more information regarding registration, contact Gwen Hoarter. She's at G-H-O-W-A-R-T-E-R -E at bradley.edu or call her at 309-677-3900. If you want more information regarding programming, you can contact Dr. Lori Russell Chapin herself at 309-677-3186 or email lar at bradley.edu. Um, but we found about 14 hours, not three and a half hours like a normal university person who's got some alpha in the first place, learning how to control it and make a lot more of it, um, you, you know. And uh, uh, Jim Hart was actually a, a, a student volunteer in an experiment at Camille's lab. And um, they hooked him up and uh, everybody at the lab went to lunch. And they forgot he was there. And a long lunch later, you know, university, some people go out for lunch and they, they take a, a long lunch. So... Three and, and he's and hooked hours. up this whole time. He's hooked up he this whole time. He was hooked up the whole time, three and a half hours. And uh, the, the, his data, the learning curve of his data basically became the basis of his PhD dissertation. So, uh, and it wasn't only his data that matched that learning curve. Other people uh, um, with, with training also uh, got the same basic learning curve. But, you know, we, we talked... Uh, alpha training to alcoholics, and it took about 14 hours for most of the alcoholics to learn it. But those alcoholics didn't come back. Now, a state hospital's 12-step alcoholism program is not as good as the best ones you can find. I mean, you can go to some pretty fancy recovery places and, you know, be treated like a king in Malibu somewhere, you know. But uh, uh, the, the, this is a state hospital. And it more resembled one flew over the cuckoo's nest than anything like, a, you know, a Malibu treatment center. Um, and, it, it, you know, it wasn't that the people that got sent out didn't come back. They had about a 90% recidivism. Uh, sometimes they came, came back really quickly. Um, it, uh, I, I remember a few that came back the same day they were dismissed. Uh, drunk as a skunk, waving bottles of alcohol around in the air and yelling at the buildings. And we had to, you know, put them into the lockup for a while to detox them. But, uh, you know, it, it, um, we the people we trained alpha, the, those guys didn't come back. 
And uh, in 1974, we saw this being for two years so successful, we wrote a grant to NIH uh, for alcoholism being trained alpha. Uh, now they didn't fund it that, you know, they quit funding everything in our feedback in the early seventies because of very poorly done research by Pashkowitz and Orn. Uh, they trained alpha up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down, never giving somebody a long enough uh, learning curve to acquire uh, like observed by, uh, by Jim Hart uh, and, and Camilla. So this on, off, on, off, on, off training, kind of like telling somebody you're going to take off in this jet, but you got to stop on the runway every hundred, couple, couple hundred feet. You know, you're never going to reach the, you know, critical speed to get lift off. And, you know, so they, they trained, showed no learning curve, and then concluded that alpha training didn't do anything. Well, the way they did it, it didn't do anything. But they, uh, the, their research was used as a dismissal of the entire field. And the government just quit funding everything in their feedback. So when we applied in 74, there was no funding. Now, 1988, 89, Peniston and Kukulski, uh talked about alpha theta training out of manager uh, uh, Elmer and Elise Green's lab. And um, it, uh, that, that pop became popularized uh, somewhat from that point forward. But it, you know, uh, the, it's a zeitgeist. I mean, the, you know, gee, no alpha in an alcoholic. Hmm, let's train alpha or alpha and theta. You know, the uh, Elmer and Elise Green were into meditative state stuff a little bit more, and they did some theta work as well. Uh, we found perfectly good efficacy with just the alpha portion of the training. But you know, the yeah, the the, the field uh, moved on and matured and. Um, uh, uh, we, we, we've got uh, a field now. Um, we don't rest on the foundation of Nazism. We we rest on the foundation of science, and the science was being done worldwide. Uh, the the fact that there was one character that was a flawed character. Uh, yeah, in, yeah. Jane, early I have a question on. about that. We're talking uh, thir- 20s, 30s, somewhere around there. The uh, the Nazis got going in the uh, early '30s, something like that. What what did they take from the learnings? Whether it was the Nazis or it, it, you know Australians, the American, whoever. What would so they picked up? They know they could pick up electricity. They could uh, measure it. What did they do with it first? What was the first in, application? In, in fact, Berger's end of it didn't come up with an application. He was still trying to come up with some way to do. Uh, telepathy or uh, communication at a distance. And that really hasn't panned out very much for um, a direct application. I mean, there there are Monroe Institute um, and uh, CIA folks that played around with uh, remote viewing and things such as that. But the, um, uh, the, that's not been a major application. The major yeah. applications occurred uh, um, out, out of uh, uh, Adrian and Matthews and Harvard from Lennox's lab and the Gibbs finding epilepsy and obviously epilepsy and encephalopathy became the uh, limits for clinical EEG. Uh, after the 1950s, there really wasn't clinical application for lots of other things. There wasn't depression or autism or or okay, let's or, talk or, about or, the or. biggest application. Brain dead. When did that? Uh, brain death was something that was uh, 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 played around with fairly early on. Um, uh, the uh, you know a live brain has electrical potentials in it, and you can measure that as uh, and you know somebody that dies basically. And um, the 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 literature about that essentially. Uh, looking for a, quote, flat line. Well, you don't really get a flat line, flat line. Uh, you have, if the heart is still beating, you get, you know, brain dead, no EEG, but you have little cardiac 
cardioballistic blips going by, a uh, slow pulse artifact from the blood vessels swelling up. And if the person is dead and their brain is actually starting to, you know, decompose chemically, there's large slow sways of, of chemical degradation that end up happening. But largely, if you catch it at the right point in time, it essentially is flat. I've recorded an EEG where the person uh, was, uh, they, they wanted to, to see what was going on with his, his brain. They had a do not resuscitate order on him. His heart stopped. Um, we, we called the, the you know, uh, cold blue, but they, they came in and, and said, well, these are do not resuscitate. As I finished the recording, he went from uh, having EEG to having uh, no EEG and no EKG. Um, and on the way to being flat, there are gigantic bursts, um, uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of microvolts down to nothing, back to hundreds and hundreds of microvolts. It's called burst suppression. And uh, it, it's, it's a, an easily identifiable pattern. I mean, it hits you in the face. My goodness, I've never seen this before. You know, flat lines interspersed with big bursts. But that's, you know, that's an end state. Is that the uh, background alpha, the resting state? Is that what you look at first or um, just nothing it, at all? There, there, you, 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 in fact, there's something called an alpha coma. Um, normally, you see alpha at the back of the head. But if somebody has uh, essentially... Uh, passed virtually completely, you can see frontal alpha or slightly slower as theta. And uh, that the alpha coma, uh, the alpha is non-responsive and it's, it's basically not um, projection to the back of the head through the lateral geniculate. This is basically brainstem through the diffuse projection system to the frontal lobe. And um, it, it it's a resting state frontal pattern that's unresponsive. Uh, the, the person doesn't uh, have uh, a res response to stimuli. There, there's no uh, cognitive presence at that point. Uh, there, uh, it's, it's a grave prognosis. You know, your prognosis is that you're going to be in the grave pretty soon. Uh, and it, uh, it, you know, it, it, it can last for a while, uh, but it's not really a recoverable pattern. Um, so we can say that's the first, that, that should have been the first application for EEG is brain death. Is that correct? Well, uh, uh, it, it, it was something that people investigated. It's not exactly a, an application because uh, you wouldn't need it to end up knowing if the person was dead yet. Um, uh, the uh, brain death is something that people needed to know uh, before the heart stops. If the brain is dead, you can harvest pieces. And that's the biggest use of brain death is saying this person is dead. The body still has some life left in it. Let's take the pieces that can be used. When did all this and start, Jay? When you were doing like mm, early seventies, sixties, or even before sixties uh, and seventies, there were there were uh, brain death determinations, and again, there's various standards. You have to have no barbiturates in you or any significant sedatives. For you have to show that it's you know, the brain isn't being suppressed from that. You can get a flat line from barbiturates, which is recoverable. You know, and you go flat. Uh, in, in fact, if you have a serious head injury and they put you in a barbiturate coma, if they do an EEG at that point, it'll be a flat EEG, barbiturate coma. And uh, it lets the brain recover without the demand for oxygen uh, because there's no activity requiring oxygen. Uh, so, you know, um, yeah, it, it, it it's a... a their standards, uh, the body temperature has to be sufficient. Uh, I, I can't remember exactly. I think it's like 82 degrees or something. But if you're way cold, you can have suppressed activity that may recover as well. 
Um, so there, there, there's specific standards uh, that the amplifier has to have uh, more sensitive settings than just the usual uh, settings of uh, seven to 10 microvolts a millimeter uh, for, for the EEG uh, devices, printing devices. Um, on screen, most of them are now, uh, you know, 50 microvolts in a centimeter, which is equivalent of five in a millimeter or so. Uh, but you, you have to be able to go down to uh, sensitivities of, of uh, two microvolts in a millimeter uh, so that you can actually see if there's some microvolt level uh, oscillations of some sort that are very, very, very faint. Um, that, that they've got to go flat, basically. And, um, it, it, you know, when, uh, when the brain uh, goes and the heart goes, um, you don't have much time to harvest anything. So uh, they'll, they'll look carefully now at brain death in order to have, you know, viable uh, transplant organs that haven't already started to decompose. So... Jay, I'm going to try and find that article. Do you remember the publication that it was in for Berger? Oh, you know, it was just uh, it was just yesterday. Okay, and I I I, I tossed out a a couple comments. You know, he was a Nazi. <laughs> I mean, uh, um, and and that uh, that there, there was a person in the field that said, you know, that's not the story of history that I learned. And, you know, this is because Niedermeyer and people like that were trying to paper over the history. And uh, he actually went online, uh, pulled up a, 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 a PubMed little history piece, and uh, they, 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 they laid it right out. You know, although there were some who said he, he was not a Nazi and he was pressured out of his job and committed suicide, uh, others, many, many others say um, you know, and they, they go on and, and talk about the reality of it. Uh, so, you know, he, yeah, trust but verify. Well, he, he trusted my comment more than what he had learned, and he went and verified uh, wh whether what he had learned or what I had said was correct. And, and uh, the, the, the don't even no provie. <laughs> trust no, but verify. I, yeah, I, I the trust but verify is fully appropriate. I mean, uh, you know. Especially if you learn something that's an outlier data point, yeah. you know, it, gee, that's not what I learned. Well, it's time to dig down and find out if what you learned was right or if what you just heard was right. And you know, no matter who the expert is, and for goodness sakes, you know, I'm an old AG tech. I, you shouldn't necessarily consider me the expert on everything. And you know, it's double check. Um, you know. Uh, yeah, but the, I, I go back to some of the early days. Uh, Charlie Yeager, who started Mayo Clinic, supervised me in San Francisco. He started the Langley Porter and the state hospitals in California. He gave me his Offner T-type amplifier, serial number one, um, uh, when he retired in his 80s. He, re he invited me to his 100th birthday. He retired and moved to Paradise, California, which since has burned to the ground. Uh, but it's after, long after he had passed. And, you know, I'm a joker. I, I stopped for just a second and say, I'll, I'll accept that invitation if you accept the invite to mine. You know, so he laughed and I said, sure. You know. The NeuroNoodle podcast is supported by listeners and businesses just like you, like our gold supporter, Applied Neuroscience, and our silver supporter, Mind Media. Earn up to 16 CEU hours by attending Applied Neuroscience NeuroGuide workshops in Madeira Beach, Florida, led by none other than Dr. Robert Thatcher himself. There are two ways you can attend, online or in person, with the link AppliedNeuroscience.com slash attend hyphen NG hyphen workshops. Earn up to 16 CEU hours now at AppliedNeuroscience.com slash attend hyphen NG hyphen workshops. 
Mind Media, get the latest EEG and neurofeedback technology from mindmedia.com. Their semi dry sensor cap is a wonder to see, and their EEG amplifiers have been trusted in the field for decades. Their neurofeedback and QEEG courses will get you up to speed in no time. Visit mindmedia.com now. Join us at the 7th Annual Super Brain Summit at Bradley University Center for Collaborative Brain Research. It's featuring speaker Dr. Mary Frances O'Connor. She's the author of The Grieving Brain, The Surprising Science of How We Learn from Our Love and Loss. If you want to get more information regarding registration, contact Gwen Hoarter. She's at G-H-O-W-A-R-T-E-R at bradley.edu or call her at 309-677-3900. If you want if you want more information regarding programming, you can contact Dr. Lori Russell Chapin herself at 309-677-3186 or email lar at bradley.edu.